Ninkase, it is you who handle the dough with a big shovel, mixing in a pit the beer bread with sweet aromatics. Ninkase, it is you who handle the dough with a big shovel, mixing in a pit the beer bread with sweet aromatics. It is you who bake the beer bread in the big oven and put in order piles of hulled grain. Ninkase, it is you who bake the beer bread in the big oven and put in order the piles of hulled grain. It is you who water the earth-covered malt, the noble dogs guard it. It is you who soak the malt in a jar, the waves rise, the waves fall. Ninkase, it is you who soak the malt in a jar, the waves rise, the waves fall. It is you who spread the cooked mash on large reed mats. Kunin's overcomes. Ninkasi, it is you who spread the cooked mash on large reed mats. Kunin's overcomes. It is you who hold with both hands the great sweet word, brewing it with honey and wine. Ninkasi, it is you who hold with both hands the great sweet word, brewing it with honey and wine. You place the fermenting vat, which makes a pleasant sound, appropriately on top of a large collector vat. It is you who pour out the filter beer of the collector vat. It is like the onrush of Tigris and Euphrates. Ninkasi, it is you who pour out the filter beer of the collector vat. It is like the onrush of the Tigris and Euphrates. This is a um, fragment from the hymn to Ninkasi. This beautiful document dates from 1800 BCE and clearly describes the brewing process in its many phases while singing the praises of Ninkasi, the ancient Sumerian goddess of brewing. And from this ancient Mesopotamian uh, document, uh, people today manage to brew a beer. Beer is the answer. A pint of cold clear, crispy happiness. I don't care about the question. Beer is an almost universal pastime. African, Asian, European and South American civilizations all had a version of this delightful alcoholic beverage to enjoy with friends and family. Water, malt, hops and yeast is all there is. And yet, we've managed to produce countless different delicious drinks from these four simple ingredients. Hello! Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure. Today's episode is a special one. I have a fantastic guest and we're about to talk about the long and deep, ancient, mysterious and fascinating history of beer. I've invited Pete Brown, the expert writer of the most convivial of all alcoholic beverages, for an ancient Greek barbecue, beer drinking and, of course, beer chatting. As you can imagine, Pete is like a, a little beer encyclopedia, a fountain of knowledge, alcoholic or otherwise, and the passion about the subject is obvious with each and every word he says. He loves the social aspect of drinking culture and the long, fascinating and often mysterious history of perhaps the most popular drink, but also misunderstood too, beer. Join us for an adventure that begins in the Neolithic era, as we travel through to ancient Mesopotamia and China, then to modern-day Sub-Saharan Africa, in our quest to quell our thirst for ancient beer. For Patreon backers only, I have an extra bit where you can find out what food uh, we barbecued and what ancient skewers of lucky we had uh, with what beer, and um, what beers we drank in general with each one. It was a fun, delicious summer evening, which uh, we all must endeavor to do more often. Beer, barbecue, and beer chilled. Now, uh, I have to apologize, as the first two short uh, answers, sentences uh, that Pete um, um, said weren't uh, recorded properly, <laughs> even with years of experience and proper equipment, there are failures and uh, gremlins in the machine. So... I hope you excuse the little um, um, crappy sounding initial um, initial answers. But however, everything sounds proper and beautiful after a minute or so. So please don't give up uh, on the first answer. Pete also gives us a little roundup of his latest book, 
Clubland, How Working Men's Clubs Shaped Britain, which is out now. Right. I hope you'll enjoy. Let's get on with it. Pete Brown, welcome to The Delicious Legacy. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. I'm very, very excited to have you. And um, it's a great honor, actually. <laughs> uh, I've been reading your books for about a decade now. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, I mean, the, the passion for good, uh, good beer and um, good drinks and beverage in general, you know, oozes from the pages of your books. Thank you very much, Jack. So, to make people first. <laughs> you definitely succeeded with me, at least. <laughs> So, yeah, it's really exciting to have you here and to talk about the history of beer. Uh, you know, you were one of... When I started this podcast, I started um, really early, early in the pandemic. So, mm. actually, before the pandemic, before the first lockdown. So, the first episodes I did, I was thinking to do about cheese, beer, wine, bread, and da da da. And uh, you were one of the first people I had in my mind for, for a guest in the yeah. podcast. Uh, and I'm finally very excited to have you here. Excellent, excellent. Great. So we can talk about the history of beer today. Yes, it's one of my favourite subjects. <laughs> it's so shrouded in mystery for something that's so universal, for something that's so global and underpinned so many different societies. It's still something that, which is undergoing a lot of conjecture. And, and the history of beer has actually changed quite a lot since I first started writing about it. Of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, with every subject, I mean, there's more and more things uh, that are getting discovered every day. So I guess with beer... Yeah, and it's this, um, I think that the big revolution for us was uh, uh, a development in carbon dating. Uh, there's a, uh, a compound that's made by fermentation of beer ingredients uh, called, well, it's nicknamed beer stone. It's calcium, I'm not going to get it right, but it's calcium compound. Um, and modern carbon dating technology can date this compound pretty accurately back to when it was found. So when I was writing my first book, the earliest evidence of beer was mainly pictorial and document-based. The hymn to Ninkazi, which dates back to 3000 BC, which is a, a hymn to the goddess of beer, but it's also a recipe for how to make beer. And that was considered the earliest evidence of brewing. But of course, if someone's writing this recipe down, that means that it's existed before then, and it's been passed down from uh, from mouth to mouth, from hand to mouth for, for generations before then. And, and what carbon dating has allowed us to do is push it back further and further. I say us, I mean really clever archaeologists. But the latest thing I've seen is, you know, before brewing itself, you get malting, which is preparing the barley grain so that it can be brewed, so that the starches in the grain break down into fermentable sugars. And the earliest evidence of that now goes back, I believe, to 10,000 BC. Wow, that's uh, really, really ancient then. So we're talking about Neolithic yeah, times. Yeah. Excellent. Right. But before we go to the history of beer, I would like firstly to know a little bit more about uh, your new book, because you have a brand new book just released, right? Yes, it was released two weeks ago, less than that. Uh, and it's called Clubland, and it's about the history of the working men's club movement in Britain, which... You may not know about, because there's hardly been anything written on it before. It's a real struggle to find anything at all that's been written about it before. Great. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's very interesting, because obviously we know working men's clubs as a place to go and drink, obviously. Mm. Uh, but yeah, we don't know anything about um, the social aspect behind it. Right? Yeah. And uh, it was a surprise to me, because I, I started my drinking just when working men's clubs were starting to lose their relevance in the communities that they were in. So when I was 18, my generation was probably the first generation that, that didn't go to them anymore. We, we didn't, there was a tradition, if I was maybe 10 years older, there was a tradition which was, you were given your membership card by your dad on your 18th birthday, and generations went to the clubs and drank together in, in close-knit industrial working class communities like the one I grew up in. And so that never happened with me. And it never occurred to my dad to give me a membership to, the, to his club. And it never occurred to me to want to be a member of his club. So part of it was kind of, why did my generation stop being interested in working men's clubs? And nobody, no other generation has been since then. Right. And and then coming at it from the other end, looking at my history of beer and pubs, uh, when you go back into the late 1900s, working men's clubs are a much bigger prospect than just this place to go and get cheap beer. And so I started coming at it from two ends, a kind of 
autobiographical memoir approach from recent history going backwards and then a kind of social and cultural history really starting with the industrial revolution and victorian london and moving forward from there so working men's club that really started mid 19th century that's yeah so if you imagine what this was like in the 1830s 1840s that was when whole communities were uprooted from the countryside and moved to cities to find work in factories. Yeah. And so the whole system changed, not just work, but social life, how you lived, where you lived, the nat- every single thing about the nature of your life changed, and there was nothing in place to regulate that. So working-class communities were living in slums. There'd be whole families to one room, smaller, much smaller than the one we're in now, with four people living in that full-time, with no sanitation, no toilets, anything like that. And then there'd be another one above you and another one below you and another one next door. And there was nothing else for working men to do. They went to work. The work was grim and horrible and soul-destroying. And then there was nowhere to go between work and coming back to this tiny cramped room, apart from going to the pub. And some pubs were great, and you know, Victorian pubs are still among some of the best we still have. But other pubs were kind of unscrupulous. They would put salt in the beer to make men drink more. They would push you to buy rounds. They would right. always encourage you to drink more and more and more. And so there were problems with domestic violence, with men going home and hurting their wives and families. And and also there was a sense that among improvers, among among reformers, there was a sense that working men needed to be educated and refined and improved yes and they needed to, that needed to happen very much in the in the sense of what the middle class people thought they should be uh, and a big thing behind this was that working men were just getting the vote and they needed to be told to vote for the right people so if they were given a proper education and got to give to read the right newspapers and watch the right drama and listen to the right lectures they would vote for the right mps <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course none of this worked out the way that uh, that anyone expected um but one idea was this uh, there were all these institutes and reading rooms and things like this and there was one guy reverend henry solly who recognised that working men needed it to be more club-like rather than you go here, you come out of one of these horrible shifts, you don't want to go to a lecture theatre. and Like a, a, a school again. You go yeah, exactly. Who wants schooled. that when you finish yeah. a full day's work? Yeah. But so he set up this idea of clubs where men could sit and relax over a cup of tea. There was no alcohol in the beginning. And then they could sneak the reform bit in through the back. Once the men were relaxed with a game of dominoes and a, and a cup of tea and a biscuit, you could kind of sneak some lecturer in to, st- <laughs> to start talking to them. So Slowly. that was the original idea of the working men's clubs. Yeah. Um, cheers. Let's uh, drink uh, mm. to your book then. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. And um, yeah, obviously the history goes through the 20th century. Yeah. And so to make it really brief, because I've, I've yet to get my chat about this down to under an hour, um, <laughs> but, but the working men took control of the clubs themselves. They proved that they were capable of running them really well. They started to create their own culture rather than that, that the middle and upper classes wanted. They had singers, comedians, and a lot of 20th century popular culture actually comes from the clubs to a much greater degree than a lot of people know. Certainly when I was growing up, Every famous face on TV started in the working men's club movement. Mm. Um, so there were so there were places you could go and have a drink. There were places you could go and just read a newspaper if you didn't want to drink. There were places you could go and see a famous comedian, uh, a world famous singer, and and all this was owned by the working classes and run by them for for their own benefit. And they extended from that to kind of providing welfare state services and uh, support for people out of work, support for people who were injured. And it became this really big cultural movement through the 20th century that no one is really aware of that it was never written about. How bizarre, no? Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) really bizarre. Uh. (laughs) It it just wasn't... The working men never really kept minutes or records of their own from what the clubs were doing. There was one big archive and that caught fire and burned. There were private members' clubs, so people outside weren't really aware of what was going within them. And then there's a bigger overarching thing, which is that it generally still journalism and history and books and analysis tend to get written by middle-class people. And there's still a very strong anti-working class sentiment mm. that working class culture is crude, that it's it's just drunks, drink sodden. Whenever you read newspaper accounts of binge drinking, it's always like, well, it's the working classes are out in town centres drinking till the sick. And that's a narrative that goes back to at least till the 1830s. And so there's always been this kind of institutional bias. Yeah, against- yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, which is, um, yeah, the bias, as you say, is sometimes it's deliberate, but sometimes it's also... yeah. Yeah. 
There's also a thing that's just like, why would you even consider it if, you, if you're not part of the club movement? Yeah. Even Dame Vera Lynn started singing in the clubs hmm. when she was seven years old. She started singing in my local club, The Mildly. And, and even she, when she wrote her autobiography in 2009, I think it was, said, you know, if you weren't part of this network, you would never know it was there. How, how interesting. Yeah, very fascinating. I mean, for me, my experience from working men's club is the one Bethel Green, basically, which, mm. yeah, throughout the noughties and early 2000s, yeah. it was basically, you would go there to see gigs and bands and yeah. some, some music, basically. But yeah, I never experienced it before that, um, in its heyday, in its glory days. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it fell into a steep decline. I think not, not, not giving equal rights to women was a real problem. Uh, women only got equal rights in, in 2007. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. In, in, the, in the 70s, there was a little bit of a problem with, with racism among some clubs. Um, so this all contributed to them being seen a bit behind the times, uh, unfashionable, and working class people became more aspirational. They became, mm. We were taught to kind of want to be middle class and to, to buy designer brands and go to nice places on holiday. The working men's clubs started to seem a little bit dowdy by comparison. I want to ask you... Um, if there's no records about the working men's clubs, how did you do your research? How did you find I got <laughs> scraps from here and there? It's interesting. There's a lot of records from when the middle class philanthropists were involved in the 19th century. They kept good records. Yeah, so and we have. As, and then as soon as they were ousted out of the club movement, they weren't interested in talking about it anymore. There's an almost complete gap between about 1910 and the 1950s where there's literally nothing, nothing. You've got to kind of piece it together from oral accounts and uh, people's memoirs and things. Uh, and then a few sociologists start to look at the movement in the 1950s. So there's cha- odd chapters in ancient, mouldy sociology books from the 50s and 60s. <laughs> um, and then when you get to the 70s, I, I found I was basically downloading Kindles of celebrity autobiographies and memoirs, word searching working men's club. <laughs> And then finding these stories about people who began their careers in working men's clubs, Tom Jones, The Fall, The the Jam. Of course, uh, yeah, um, yeah. All all kind of cutting their teeth in working men's clubs and uh, and writing about it in these memoirs. So there was a bit of that. And then there is now a, a club journal kind of trade magazine that records various things. And one other person has written a book, uh, Dr. Ruth Cherrington, wrote a, self-published a book about 10 years ago, which was oral histories, all the older club members that she knew and grew up with. Uh, she wow, she okay. caught their stories before before they died, basically. Uh, so her, hers was my starting point. Brilliant. And how long did it take you to write this book? So I've been wanting to write it for 20 years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to write it straight after I wrote my first book, Man Walks Into a Pub. And London-based publishers just said, well, yeah, but only old people in the North would want to read this and old people in the North don't read. So I said that at a literature festival at North the other week. Oh, and dear. You can imagine how that went yeah. down. Um, <laughs> like it proved them wrong anyway. Yeah. It proved them very, very wrong. <laughs> Uh, and then a publisher, Harper North, a branch of Harper Collins, opened uh, an office in Manchester, and they were specifically looking for books that were more relevant to the North, about the North. And although Working Men's Club started in London and spent their first 50 years in London, which mm-hmm. not a lot of people know, um, it's very much associated with the North of England. Right. Uh, okay. And so that was very good for Harper North. Great. And um, you've done an audio book of the of it, right? Yes, I got to read it myself. <laughs> For the first time, it was great. Which I'm very annoyed that I didn't record, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> never mind the next one. I would have tried your patience. <laughs> it's all right. Um, but it's, it's nice It's nice now because uh, you mentioned Bethnal Green, and to a lot of people, the clubs are irrelevant now, and there is a strong argument, I think, that as spaces and as community organisations, they can be reinvented. Mm. And, and Bethnal Green gives a voice and a space to, I would say, a lot of marginalised artistic voices who, who don't get a, 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 a platform yeah. in a lot of places. Um, and in, in I think they're probably the most kind of progressive version of it, but there's a, there's a lot of other clubs that are saying, well, we have these old concert rooms where we used to have all the comedians in the 60s and 70s. And the, the forward thinking clubs are going, well, there's local mother and baby classes, there's scout troops, there's bands who want to rehearse, there's coffee mornings. There's all these amazing things that communities want to do. And in the last 12 years, we've seen all those spaces taken away by austerity measures. And the club is there, and it's like, if the clubs could just kind of open up, there's a huge need for them again now in, yeah, in the communities. So that's my kind of 
rallying call at the end of the book, really. Great. I hope. I hope. Yeah. I hope it succeeds, and I hope. Yeah, things uh, get better in that respect. I mean, again, community self-organizing. It's very important, and I think the last, I don't know, thirty years we forgot about it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 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 So, um, so there's some beer in there. But uh, as you can tell, it's a little bit of a departure for me in terms of going. I've always been more, more interested in the kind of social and cultural sides of mm. what I write about. Yeah, uh, I've grown very much to love the <laughs> the sort of degustatory aspects of it as well. But yeah, this is a real kind of it's like ten percent beer and ninety percent social history and a little bit of politics yeah. uh, and, and a, a little bit of music and entertainment yeah. as well. Well, I think throughout all your books, you had a little bit of politics in them. I think. Yeah. I mean. It wasn't very obvious, but there was a lot of things that they were political. In, in, I always in write respects. from a. I always write with an authorial voice, which is my voice. I, I never try. I once did a journalism course, and they said, "You are not the story. Take yourself out. You are the eyes and the ears of the reader, and you should be invisible." Mm-hmm. And I've never been able to do that, which mm. is which is why I never really describe myself as a journalist because I'm not. I'm I'm not good enough at journalism to be a journalist but yeah I can't stop my own attitudes and 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 voice and opinions creeping in and you know it's like when I when I read my Amazon reviews which of course I never read my Amazon reviews uh but if I if I did read my Amazon reviews um that that kind of personal bit the politics the message that I put in um that gets me both five star and one star reviews (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can't please everybody yeah. some people really respond well to what I write and if those people respond well to it other people are going to respond really badly to it uh, my favourite review of um, Hops and Glory on Amazon it, the guy loves the book but accuses me of um, accuses me of too, having too much fake colonial guilt Right, and it's like alright oh, so because researching that book I found out the true story of what the British Empire did in India and what mm. the atrocities perpetrated by the East India Company and that is part of the story of IPA it has to yeah. be yeah and that was how many years ago now the, the book or the, the atrocities the book the, the, the book <laughs> the, yeah yeah the book that was uh, 12 years ago now yes uh, and, and I think we've, we've become more open and more aware of those yeah. kind of things now I think, I think the last week. decade yeah. we, we've definitely been but it's just striking when some guy who's never met me and knows nothing about me uh, gets to decide whether my guilt over Britain's atrocities in India is imaginary or not you know <laughs> that, that's like, astonishing oh, I mean, he was um, psychotherapist you can tell that <laughs> you can tell that my guilt is not real just from reading my book that's incredible brilliant brilliant uh well, okay. Well, we should uh, move slowly, I guess, to yes. the very first um, traces of beer. I would, I would think. Um, so, I guess one th- one thing you probably you found through your books and you, through your um, research all these years. Why did we start drinking beer? Is one question, <laughs> obviously. And how long ago was that? Yeah. That's another question. I think I think the great thing about humanity, and this is always the argument that I put across when people think of drinking as unnatural or, or dangerous or a bad thing for society, is our relationship with alcohol is as old as we are as a species. And without wanting to minimise the negatives of alcohol abuse, overall alcohol is a net beneficial effect on a population which is not great to hear if you have a, a friend or a relative who's struggling with alcoholism or whatever, but, you know, most people don't. And so we we, we have a genius for w- allowing things that grow around us to ferment into something that not only has a pleasant buzz, but also tastes nice. Yeah. So, so some form of wine was probably the earliest alcoholic drink or mead, because wine you can pick some grapes, you know, you're, you're, you're on a horse riding across the... Uh, the plains, sort of the yeah, plains. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you put some grapes in a leather bag it's ro- moving against your horse the grapes get crushed there's natural yeast on the skins and you come to open your your bag full of grapes and you've got wine hmm. so i don't know how long that goes back but that's you know as as, as, as long as we've been picking grapes basically. yeah yeah basically as long um and uh and beer's a bit different because beer's made out of grain and there's a fundamental difference between fruit and grain in that fruit wants to be eaten. It wants to be picked by roving animals and insects and birds and you name it. Because if, if we were to kind of pick some lovely grapes off a tree uh, as we're wandering across the plains, we eat them, we enjoy them, and the next morning we do a little poo in the grass, uh, having gone 10 miles down the road, and we poo out those grape seeds or apple seeds or 
peach stones or whatever yeah. that we've thrown away. And and we help the plants to spread in ways exactly. it can't do on its own. Now, grain is not the same. Grain is on a, a tall stalk. It's very light. Uh, it can grow really well in a field full of grain, you know, a big, a big tree. A little tree is not going to survive if the fruit just falls to the floor. It needs mm. to be further away. But grain can grow in a big field next to lots of other stalks of grain, and the wind can blow it far enough. So, so grain doesn't want to be eaten. It wants to preserve all its sugar for the little embryo that's in the thing. So if we want to make alcoholic drink out of grain, we have to trick it into softening the outside shell, which is rock hard. When you pick a grain kernel, you press it between your fingers and it'll leave a pretty big dent. Yeah. You can crush it between your teeth and you, you don't, you, you're not going to get anywhere. And so we trick the grain into germinating so that the outer shell softens and the sugars, the starch inside, it, it breaks down into sugar that we can ferment. So that requires some serious technology. Yeah, um, definitely. You, you don't just get that by picking some grain and putting it in a bag. There's been a long-standing theory that this might have happened by accident, by someone picking some grain, leaving it in a a, a pot uh, outside, and it rains and the grain gets wet, and it starts to ferment, and someone drinks it and says, hey, we've got beer. That can happen. Right. <laughs> that does not happen. Uh, I think I probably put that in my first book, in the first draft of it. Since then, people have done experiments. <laughs> like, I know, I'll pick some grain, I'll put it in a pot, <laughs> wet it and see what happens. Guess what? <laughs> you don't get Nothing. beer. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> there's no beer. Yeah. Because there's no germination. There's, yeah. no, there's no molting that happens. You just get this foul-smelling... By the time it's happened, it's gone rancid and you've just got this foul-smelling concoction, which is not alcoholic. So, so that didn't happen. So somewhere along the line... And it's probably brewing and baking, bread baking are probably tied up very, very, very close closely, together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because at early brewing, you used to make these cakes, these kind of malt cakes, and then when you wanted to brew beer, you'd get one of the cakes because they would store for a long time. So that cake was kind of a fairly close relative of bread. Yes. So, I, so I think both bread and beer have a common ancestor in this in this malting process. And, and there's a big argument as to whether people began malting first to make bread or to make beer, but either way, they're two pretty cool <laughs> things. But, yeah. but they require this technology. They required the, the, the grain to be wet, and so it germinated, then to be laid out and dried, and, and you had to know why you were doing that. And that probably took a process of thousands and thousands of years to get right. Mm. You know, when you think about these generations of people... And, you know, apple, so some, some fruit as well, the grafting of uh, different fruit cuttings onto, onto rootstock. Yeah. You know, th- th- these are technological processes that no one really knew what the science was behind them, but just thousand years of trial and error. Eventually people went, well, hang on a minute, we don't know why, but if we do this with a grain and then we spread it out and dry it, and then we put it in a pot and stir it with a stick, we get something quite nice at the end of it. Mm. We don't know why, so it must be the gods. Yeah, <laughs> but but we're now doing the ritual that the gods wanted us to do. We've now got the ritual right, so the gods are blessing us with what we now call fermentation. And of course, it's something nutritious and something delicious. Yeah, and it's something that we please the gods with. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so we're gonna sit around and do it even more. Exactly. So there's a uh, yeah. We, we didn't know that that yeast was the agent of fermentation for sure until about the 1860s. And we've, yes. been, and we've been brewing since 10,000 BC. So yeah. put that into context of like what a 24-hour clock is. You know, yeah. like, I, yeah. I did this once. I can't remember it fully, but it's like on a 24-hour clock, it's sort of like if Jesus walked to the earth at 7 o'clock in the evening, then we found out that yeast ferments beer at about half past 11 at night or something like something that. Something like you know, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's really, it's really blows your mind. So for all that time, we've done this stuff. We've made beer without knowing quite... How, how why, and why it's happening? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So of course you would blame the gods for it. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbian Creek, UK's leading supplier of premium Creek produce, wine, herbs, cheeses, or olive oil from all over the wild corners of the country, and working directly with small artisanal producers. Grace uh, might be known better for her wines and ouzo, but thankfully has some exquisite beers too. In this scorching weather, why not refresh yourselves with a cold Nisos organic lager from Malby and Greek? It provides a refreshing taste for the hot summer days ahead. It's pure, clear, crisp and bright. Or try a nice cold Yellow Donkey from the Santorini Brewing Company, the perfect accompaniment for a meal by the sea, relaxing at the beach or drinking with mates. At Malby and Greek, you'll also find 
a number of different style beers and ales brewed by talented Greek microbreweries. So what are you waiting for? Whatever you need, Malbian Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the exquisite goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art 17, Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malby in Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. And for you dear listeners, you can get a serious 15% discount if you go to malbyandgreek.com slash delicious and use that to get 15% off your next purchase. And it's very fascinating. So I guess, as you said earlier on, we started uh, from Neolithic times, more or less, like 10,000 years. Mm. So that was before we were still hunter gather nomads more or less right well this is the this is why beer has been uh, credited with being the foundation of civilization in terms of permanent settlements mm. so as i explained before you can enjoy decent wine when you're living a nomadic horseback existence yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you can even you can even grow and harvest grain uh you know because you can plant a little crop here you can go off on your little 10 month circuit around yes. the plains and come back and your your grain's ready or your fruit harvest or whatever. But proper malting requires permanent structures. Yeah. Uh, it requires malting floors. Uh, it requires big um, troughs of some kind. It requires very smooth floors. Uh, and so I know some archaeologists who uncovered these really weirdly smooth floors in a settlement building on the west coast of Ireland. And this is not the only place where they've been found. Right. And, and they surmised that they were possibly early maltings Oh, wow, uh, for, okay. for malting the grain. And they found kind of fossilised grain samples in, in some of the cracks and stuff. How long ago was that? So that was 3000 BC okay. on the west coast of Ireland. Wow. And I think similar structures have been found in Spain and in certainly in Israel. Right, um, right. But, but, they're, but they're permanent stone buildings. They, yeah. they had to be. You can't just do this on, on horseback. So we had to settle down to build permanent structures in order to make beer. Mm. And the... the archaeological evidence of us doing that coincides with the first cities. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and obviously that was, uh, I guess, uh, in the Fertile Crescent? Yes. So yes. that was the kind of... Uh, but uh, do we have our first evidence from Egypt, ancient Egypt or ancient Mesopotamia about the, the beer? So uh, it used to be, as it's gone backwards, it used to be Egypt because it was very well documented in, mm. in hieroglyphics and things in Egypt. So we didn't need the biological evidence yeah. to establish bring in Egypt in the first, in the couple of millennia either side of yeah. Christ or whatever. Then it went back to ancient Babylon and Samaria was when I started writing Samaria was, one, was considered the real home. Yeah, of we're beer. talking about yeah 5000 years ago or something yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that that was the Hinton in Kazi. Uh it was other recipes and, and documentary evidence and so on. And then as the as the carbon dating evidence is built up, it seems to have happened simultaneously in northern China. And the most recent evidence, uh, th- th- then there was oh, Turkey. There's Turkey found. Turkey was um, around the site of what is considered to be. I've forgotten the name of it. Gaude Tepe. Gobleki Tepe. Yeah, that's the one uh, where King Midas is two more. His father was. There's a lot of evidence there. Uh, and then that the earliest uh, evidence of malting that I've come across is uh, read about is uh, in Israel. Right. So uh, it, it just keeps getting pushed back, but it's generally around that area. Yeah, yeah. But so we have something in northern China. You said mm. uh, okay. And um, obviously the Fertile Crescent and Turkey and Israel and all that stuff. And so what w- what do we consider as beer? What's the definition of beer then? So the definition of beer is an alcoholic drink which has grain as the rather than fruit as the primary source of its fermentable sugars. Mm. So, you know, that takes a lot of different... Forms, exactly. And I would have loved to have brought you some ancient beer from that time because it's still being made in in the world today. Right. But it's being made for... The ceremony is in China, and it's mainly being uh, made in uh, Africa, in Central and Southern Africa. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and and they still do it the same way. Uh, in, in some of the archaeological finds, there have been these big pots, and the images are of people drinking beer through very long straws. So there'll be like 10 people around a pot with these three-foot-long straws. Some of the, some of the pictures, rather, show... Um, so people doing that, and then other people sitting in chairs drinking what looked like wine glasses. And so this started this uh, theory that wine was always been for upper-class well-to-do people <laughs> and that the poor people had to share this big pot of beer. And then when they excavated some of the tombs, they found these pots, found evidence of beer stone inside them, and they were made out of silver and the straws were encrusted 
in, in yeah. jewels and, and all this kind of stuff. So that was just the way you drank beer and the way you drank wine. And it appeals to me in terms of thinking, well, beer has always been the most sociable drink, so people gather around to drink it. Exactly. Um, but the bigger thing about it, the bigger reason for it, I think, was that it more resembled porridge. You know, so it was, it was fermented grain in liquid, in water, uh, and that grain was still in there. So people were drinking the straws through straws as a way of filtering it. Uh, yeah. And if you go to the 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 beer the brewing museum in in Johannesburg, in South Africa, they've got a little mock up of a shebeen brewery, and they show you a video of it, of the beer being made. And so they get the grain, the malted grain, they put it in water, they give it a good stir, and then they invoke the gods. So they get a magic wand, basically. When when you start to get to the more speculative side of stuff, this is the origin of the wizard with the magic wand, right? <laughs> which is the whole, which is the holy stick, which has been imbued with the spirits of the ancestors, and and you you have to stir the beer with this stick in order to make it ferment. Yeah. So you stir it, you say the you say the prayer to the ancestors, and lo and behold, a few hours later, it starts bubbling away and fermenting. It's a gift from the gods. What we now know. <laughs> Is that if they're using that stick in every single brew, it has it's full of dormant yeast cultures <laughs> that you can't see. So you stir it through a nice warm vat of, of of wort of kind of unfermented beer, and the yeast cultures wake up. They start eating the sugar, turning it to alcohol, and and there you go. So and then and then you watch the video in this museum, and then they bring you through a bowl of the beer to taste, and it basically tastes like. It tastes like really sour porridge. Mm, sour porridge, okay. Yeah. It does sound very appealing, but it <laughs> so does. It's it grainy, does... it's worty, and the sourness comes from the fact that the yeast cultures that they use are, are wild yeah. yeasts. Yeah, so exactly. they've got all sorts of different things going on there, all kind of spouting out these different flavour compounds as, as they ferment the, the, the sugar. Mm. And you said that some people still make uh, yes. yeast. We have. So All right. in, in the kind of ta- in in the in, in some of the kind of traditional communities in South Africa, especially, mm, mm, uh, mm. and through some of the other African countries, they they still make it that way. Yeah, was it uh, the first be oh, porridge like anyway concoctions made from barley? Was it the barley the yes. first uh, yeah. the first ever? Yeah. So yeah, the cultivation the cultivation of grasses is another thing I could I, I've not yet got nerdy about it, but I could. You know, the, the seven noble grains include rice, wheat, barley, maize, and all of them have a big role to play. Y- you can make all of them. I'll, yeah, you can use all of them in beer. Exactly, yeah. You know, but, but barley is the one that just seems to give the best results for mm, beer. Um, yeah. In terms of flavour and in terms of utilisation, in terms of getting the amount of sugar out. You know, if you're going to spend a year growing a crop, you, you want to get the most out of it at the end of it, and barley seems to work most efficiently for beer. Famously, I think the the ancient Greeks, they didn't drink beer. Apparently, they were considered as the drink of the barbarians. Yes. But what we say barbarians, of course, they meant people who didn't speak the Greek language. So yes. the foreigners, basically. It was a drink of the foreigners, which um, it's very curious because the the Greek mainland was it's very poor agriculture. So people relied in barley. So they grew, they grew a lot of barley in, mm. in, in ancient Greece. So that was the main staple for breads and food. So if you grow so much barley because the, the soil is poor, why don't you make beer? It was a very, it's a very interesting thing. To I would think imagine about. it's pre- probably because of that malting step. It's the, it's the fact that you've got to, and I don't know, I don't know if you've got to put quite as so much work into it to, to bake bread or not. You can certainly use unleavened yes it was it was an unleavened unleavened the, yeah. The bread. yeah yeah whereas whereas you can't get anything for beer unless you unless you go through this long complex process, process of, yeah. of, of, of malting the barley it's very interesting i mean yeah they considered as a drink of of the others and there is a passage in xenophon's uh, march of the Ten Thousand when they left the, the army the greek merchant army left persia and they marched through the desert and through armenia to go to the black sea and they found a tribe there, and they drank a barley wine mm. through straws, and so you had reed straws because, as you said, it was it was uh, yeah. like that. So it's very interesting that, that there was not a, a beer culture in Greece, but it was yeah, it was wine. But yeah. every everywhere else there was a beer culture, even in the north of Greece, the Thracian tribes and the Paeonian tribes they had mm. beers. They, they mentioned, yeah. and it's just Greece. I think you always when you, when you got that civilization. I mean. By that point, I'm speculating here. Wine technology probably leapt ahead of beer making technology, in in terms of you know when I was saying what what you learn over those thousands of generations, mm. if you can make wine relatively easily, I guess you would have fairly quickly 
figured out which grape varieties give you the best wine and which blends create the nicest wines. So I'm I'm totally guessing, but I would guess ancient Greek wine wouldn't be too far away from from what we drink now. Mm. Um, whereas beer has had to do quite a lot of work yeah. <laughs> since then <laughs> to, 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 to become, get to yeah. what we've got now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, of course, the beer now is very different from what it was, you know, two, three thousand, mm. four thousand years ago. But from what you say, it seems that we kind of know how it tasted, more or less, right? Or yeah. we have yeah. an idea of how it tasted. I think that, thanks to that continuity that's been provided by essentially not changing in Africa. And when I tasted this sour porridge, I, went, I my a light went on the matter. I thought, oh, of course, it tastes like a Belgian lambic. Right. Of, of course it would. You know, it's a very different consistency in yeah. that field. Yeah. Because of course it tastes like a Belgian lambic. It's been made with wild yeast. It's, it's fermented some decent barley. We've got all these flavour compounds coming from the yeast, these kind of acetic things and, and sour things, and also kind of fairly musty farmyardy aromas. And it took me a while, but I'm a fan of Belgian lambic beers now. <laughs> and, Great. <laughs> and, and so there was a connection there. And, and, and other people were on the museum tour going, oh, that's disgusting, that's horrible. It doesn't taste like beer. I said, no, but it tastes like beer tasted it tastes like a lot of beer tasted until we got laboratory cultivated yeasts in the 1870s yeah and that's really really 150 years ago isn't it 160 yeah. years ago it's not that long ago at all it's just not a few all. generations not at all. they they recreated the first ever they actually found Kalsberg found a bottle of beer from 1883 which still had live recoverable yeast samples in it <laughs> So they rebrewed a bottle of the first ever single strain yeast lager from 1883, and um, there was this huge ceremony where loads of us were flown over to to Copenhagen. And there was this huge ceremony, and it's like, well, it kind of tastes like beer, <laughs> and it was a, it was a massive anticlimax. So it's just like it because, tastes, yeah, it's it's clean, it's balanced, it tastes like beer, and and I was kind of struggling with that. I thought, yes, but imagine being the first people in the world to taste beer that tastes like this. Yeah. Imagine yeah. every single other beer you'd had before this had been funky or a bit sour or a bit mixed or there was a variability from one batch to the next. Yeah. And this is every single flavour in this glass is a flavour that the brewer wanted to be there and there's nothing else in it. Yeah. And that was a revolution. And it's a, it's a revolution we've got used to very, very quickly. <laughs> and now everyone's going, oh, can we have the wild yeast again? Let's, yeah. go, back, let's go back and then mix fermentation, <laughs> spontaneous fermentation. And let's, let's, let's get some of those old varieties back out. And there was the ghosts of the people who spent their lives the, yeah, <laughs> <they're> <laughs> trying to get rid of those flavours from beer. It's going, oh, my God. They will rise from the graves and they will <laughs> yes. haunt us forever, I think. But, yeah, I mean, I understand that. I mean, I kind of get bored occasionally from uh, from the same language and I'm trying something new mm. and all the stuff. And then you're like, oh, yeah, okay. But sometimes you want that same, yeah. that the stability. It's yeah. so great to be able to have the choice. Mm. Yeah, um, well, yes. I, I went to a wild fermentation festival. There is such a thing in, 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 in Amsterdam a few years ago. <laughs> of course in Amsterdam. <laughs> Carnival Britannomyces. And I had the best day tasting all these. And it was it kind of spread its scope from beer to other forms of wild fermentation, you know, kimchi and, mm. uh, and and things like that. So we're tasting all these different funky wild flavours. And it was a great day. And by five o'clock, I was like, someone get me a pint of Amstel now. <laughs> <laughs> I want a clean, crisp, cold lager in my face right now. <laughs> and, it's, and it's great to be able to kind of explore the wild side and then come back yeah, yeah. to the kind interesting. of lovely, Very interesting. clean yeah. benefits of a, of a crisp lager. Um, maybe we should have a, a lambic beer now then. We should. I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the one flavour thing we're, we're going to get that is that link to the past, I think. Thank you very much. So, what we've got here is Frank Boone's Oud Gers. So, this beer is made by, you do the malting, you put the water in, you mix the grain up, uh, and then the, the sugared liquid you've got, they put it, every other kind of brewery in the world goes to great extremes to prevent any contamination from other bacteria. What a Lambic Brewery does is the opposite. They put the beer out in a big shallow trough open to the elements, saying, wild bacteria, please come, come in. in. <laughs> please come in and inoculate this beer. And and they brew, so when it initially brews, they then store it in wooden barrels. 
a, a, sh- a young lambic kicks like a, a horse. It's just, it's so sharp and so in your face, very, very sour. And sometimes beer, like, beer writers get lazy and start to talk about these as sours. Mm. And what happens with a Gers, rather, is that you store it for up to three years in these wooden barrels. So it then starts to take on the characteristics of the barrel, any previous occupants that the barrel had, yeah. uh, the, the microflora that are living in the cracks in the wood. And then you get this, it, it mellows out. It becomes a bit more sophisticated, a bit calmer. And then what a Gers blender does is blend some of the young stuff with some of the old stuff to his... So again, it's like whiskey blending or wine blending. It's all in the palate and the nose of the of, of the blender as to as to what the result's going to be. So so this is not quite the raw stuff. Yes, that you would yeah. have got. This is not quite the taste of the sour porridge. Yeah, because this but, one. Yeah, but, it these, feels... but these elements are in there. The mm. same elements are in there. It feels familiar, even though it's very different. It feels something that mm. it can be easily drunk by anybody. Yeah. So I think the first time you smell a beer like this. It smells off <laughs> because yeah. because it's quite pungent and it doesn't smell. Often people struggle to describe the aromas of hops and barley. It's like, well, it smells of beer. And, and this, this doesn't smell of beer. To me, it's got some kind of uh, citrus, lemony, uh, sherbet type notes to it. And it's also got this, this real funk, this, yeah. this real kind of, you know, all those words that we sometimes use when describing food and drink that sound like horrible words, <laughs> but in the context of what you're drinking or eating, they make sense. Where, where people say that cheese cheese smells of smelly feet. Or barnyard, or yeah, fa- yeah, smelly feet, yeah, yeah. barnyard flavour. And this has definitely got some barnyard in there. It's got some of that, you know, the way that, yeah, if, if you're on a farm, the smell of manure isn't quite awful mm, <laughs> in yes. the way that you might think it should be. It's, no. It smells good. <laughs> it, smell, it smells of richness and the countryside and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, beer has a very long history, as we've seen, and you know we can we can talk about it forever because uh, it's ten thousand years that we have to cover, and <laughs> we don't have ten thousand years. I think uh, we have <laughs> we have a barbecue to do, <laughs> excellent, <laughs> which we're going to try some ancient Greek recipes, even though the ancient Greeks had wine with their food, but we'll have some uh, nice yeah, beer. I haven't it. got any ancient Greek beer, obviously, but I've got some beers. I've brought some beers with me, which might challenge. I hope he might challenge wine supremacy. Great. Uh, in, the, in the way that we always think about matching wine with food. Yes. I've brought some interesting beers, and not all of them is going to go with everything, but they might do some matches, some kind of harmonising of flavours in a way that wine perhaps can't mm. always. And this, yeah, this uh, this kind of wine supremacy thing, which is, how recent is it? I mean, is it something that it surely hasn't been always like this? I guess, I guess... It's been in the Western European psyche a little bit more because of mm. Roman and Gre- Rome and Greece and that kind yeah. of... I mean, Rome and Greece always prioritised wine over beer. You've talked about ancient Greece. I can't remember who it was I wrote about, but Roman generals who came to Northern Europe found this wine made of barley smells of goat. Uh, <laughs> and, and like, which, you know, if you smell this, but lambic, it you is, know, it's it kind is. of... <laughs> And uh, you could kind of see what they meant. But um, so those cultures always preferred wine. There's a strange thing with the Normans in Britain because we always confuse Norman and French. I mean, the Normans spoke French by the time they conquered Britain, but they weren't French. They were Vikings. Yeah. Also, at the time, they, they drank more cider than they drank wine. Right. Um, you know, they, 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 it was the Normans who probably brought proper cider making to, to Britain, let alone wine. But, but what, what has stayed in British culture is, even today, anything French is superior to anything English, anything Anglo-Saxon. So whenever you, you hear anyone using a posh word for something, it's always the French word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we have cooking, we have cuisine. We have a cook, we have a chef. <laughs> so we true. Ca- yeah. So true, yeah. Which always, always, consider, always amuses me because, you know, we, we have people opening brasseries that serve fine wines when brasserie is actually the French word for brewery. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so, yeah, beer is very, obviously, it became very popular in antiquity throughout Europe, right? As you said, you've, we found in ancient Ireland, mm. in, the, in the west of Ireland, evidence of brewing like yeah. 2,000 years, 3,000 years ago. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, 3,000 BC, so 3,000 BC, 5,000 years ago, yeah, yeah. Even, even, wow, that's really old. So, yeah, beer culture, I guess, spread all over, yeah. all over Europe. And, and back, back in the day, um, again, around the time I started 
working on this, th- there is this, you know, the, uh, the human tendency to, to see patterns where they don't exist. Uh, and people were doing very torturous things of going, okay, so brewing started in in the, the Fertile Crescent. So how did it get from there to here? Well, it must have come here with the with the ancient Phoenicians and then gone up this bit here, and, and then they must have taken it to there, and then when they conquered that, they must have taken it back home with them. And the more, probably the, the truer version, is that it started up, it sprang up in many different places independently. Right. Um, it didn't have to travel from one place to the next. That makes sense. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you get a version of beer brewed that's been brewed in uh, Central America for thousands of years before Europe right. discovered what was going on in, in Central yeah, America. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so they, they at least developed it independently. There's a yeast culture. There's a parent of lager yeast, which has been traced back biologically to Central America. But it arrived in Europe a couple of centuries before any European discovered America. How bizarre. So how I mean, the hell did that happen? You know, and it's full of these mysteries. Yeah, and I remember one thing uh, you were talking, I think, on your book, uh, Miracle Brew, about the barley and about uh, the roads, the ancient roads. It follows the... Yes. Go so on, tell the, us about that. That's the, the Icknield Way yes. from East Anglia, from up around the North Norfolk coast down to the coast, the, the southern, southwest coast of, around, around sort of Dorset. And it's one of the oldest tracks in Britain. One of the oldest, it's, it's, it's very heavily disputed how old it is, because it was mythologised. Mm. People, people, people were mythologising it in the Middle Ages. Right, okay. So um, it was always... always, so it's always and it's like, okay, so it must be the Romans who... And it's, and it's not, but however old it is, it's very, very old. And it just happens to link all the best barley-growing areas in, in Britain. How did we found that out? I mean, how uh... again? I think I think it's one of those wonderful things that happens with generations. You know, I guess I guess if you're a barley farmer, you might start off in North Norfolk and plant a few fields. They might go a bit further south and go. Hang on a minute, it's quite good here as well. And then go over here, it's like oh, it's no good there. But then go a bit further down here, oh, it's like, that's good. It's, it's going to take you a few centuries, but eventually you're gonna you're gonna do the whole. You're yeah, gonna yeah. find as you spread, you're gonna find the whole thing. And of course, yeah, yeah, we, as populations. Uh, expand, then they want to find their own land, I guess. So mm. yeah, you move somewhere else that you have good grounds. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was it was a very kind of mind blowing thing that you know for for thousands of years you have this uh, kind of road, this way of that links. Yeah, and it may be coincidence, but I I really don't think it is. I, I think it, I think it's good fertile land for that crop. Yeah, um, for barley, yeah. for beer. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, uh, and that's a very important part times. of our culture. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, if, if it's then merchants coming along and buying in different parts of the country, then they might strengthen the idea of a road bet- between the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, brilliant. These things, they always fascinate me so much. And, uh, you know, your books, they have <laughs> so many facts about... about I mean, because that's that. It's social, it's history... It's uh, convivial and, you know... It, Absolutely. Yeah, and that's, that's the important things about... Uh, right, it, it strikes me that you know, there are several... I've got, I've, got a, I've got a speech on this in uh, Colonial Williamsburg in November, but there are several different ways of approaching history, and I, I veer towards the irritating approach of history <laughs> because you, you've, got, you've got the forensic guys who go, well, if there's no evidence of this happening, then it didn't exist. Mm. So when I wrote Shakespeare's Local, there's no documentary evidence of Shakespeare ever having drunk in the George Inn. Yeah. So therefore he didn't do it. He never went to the George Inn. It's like, really? Well, you, you can't prove that he didn't, just as I can't prove that he did. But let's look at circumstantial evidence. He lived in Southwark for 10 years. Yeah. Um, he lived just around the corner from this row of br- brilliant, beautiful, ancient coaching inns. And he went to the pub nearly every day, and he lived there for 10 years. And the George was a really famous pub at that time. Of course he went there. <laughs> And it's like, well, you can't prove he did, so it, it so he never did. And it's like, well, there's no there's no proof of him going to the toilet. There's no proof of him buying. <laughs> there's no proof of him buying clothes or eating food. Well, yeah, yeah, but, but exactly. I bet, I mean, I bet he still did. Yeah, he did. And he drank <laughs> beer as well as, yeah. as everybody else did at the time. Yeah. yeah so yeah. And see, see, so I I got this detective approach, and it's kind of like, well, this is probably what happened in the absence of any evidence. This is a good working theory of what happened. And there's a certain breed of historian who gets very upset by that kind of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, 
Well, yeah, one of the reasons that I'm fascinated with ancient food is obviously because of the history element, of the social element, and also this unknown thing that you, we don't know how it tasted, the food, right? Mm. We're just guessing and we just, I'm trying to recreate something in our modern times with ancient ingredients and ancient techniques and whatever, what have you, and ancient recipes if we have something. But we don't really know how it tasted, but it doesn't mean that they didn't no. enjoy it or it wasn't it wasn't great. Yeah, so it's kind of... I mean, the, th- the, thing, that, the thing that I... Again, it's. I think this is disputed as well. But but if we'd been alive two or three thousand years ago, we would have had the same size brains we've got now. We would have had the same or similar kind of tendencies towards a, a same sense of humour or taste in food or interests and so on. If we'd been cooking food, we would have learned yeah. some of the same techniques. Yeah, and and mastered them. You know, we would have. There's, there's a lot of continuity. I, I, in Shakespeare's Local, I found out that a, this guy who drank in the pub in uh, 15, no, 1650 right. spent his time standing at the bar telling fart jokes and knob gags. <laughs> and this was the control of Charles II's Royal Navy. Yeah. It's like people go to pubs to tell jokes about bodily functions. Yeah. And yeah. they were doing it 500 years ago. So they were probably doing it a thousand years ago. Um, yeah, there's no, there's, yeah, exactly. And, right. and you can, and you can use that, I think, with people, human nature doesn't change, which is why we still read Shakespeare, because it's about human nature and human nature is consistent. Uh, and so I think that means that if you're given some, some meat or some, <laughs> some, some milk and some rennet, you're probably going to do similar things with them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and we will, we will master the techniques of the time that we have and the technology as well, and we'll we'll create something that will be tasty for for, for us. Yeah, yeah. You know, we like the taste of fat. We we like we like sweetness. We like the effect of alcohol. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming in and talking about uh, briefly about the history of beer in uh, in the ancient times. And um, let's go and. Have some uh, barbecue now, Let's then. Let's do that. Fantastic. <laughs> and now, for the exclusive bit for Patreon backers only, Pete and I will be having a chat about beer and ancient barbecue, flavour combinations and what went uh, well with what. Have a peek. All right. Okay. So, uh, we had a bit of uh, marinated uh, uh, mutton. Expertly marinated mutton. Yeah. <laughs> With a lovely honey and wine sauce. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I loved the uh, combination of what we now regard as different cuisines. Um, and, as we were talking about earlier... and this is it. A short history of ancient beer. Thank you all for listening. It's been a great fun episode for me and I hope you enjoyed that too. And remember to rate and review the podcast wherever you get uh, your podcasts from uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts uh, Pocket Casts uh, and so on uh, Acast and remember also to subscribe Thank you for listening I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast Oh, the book